we'll start with introductions. It's so funny not to be able to see everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Amy Rosenblum. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Chalkbeat. And I'm here with Ebony Rose Thompson. And I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ebony Rose Thompson. I am a base in DC. Uh, and I've been at uh, Schusterman Family Philanthropies for about three and a half years. Thanks, Ebony Rose. And I've been at Chalkbeat almost coming up on my on one year. And Ebony Rose is one of our first uh, program officers that I had the pleasure of meeting. And we're excited to come to you today and talk about a little bit about our philanthropy at Chalkbeat, how we approach it, and then give you a broader view on from Ebony Rose's lens as a program officer, excuse me, on from a foundation who's supporting a lot of different uh, nonprofits and efforts um, and collectives across the across the country. So we are going to this is all based on the local news roadmap that uh, was published. And so we'll answer a few of our questions on how we approach it at Chalkbeat and have approached it in the past. And then I'll turn it over to Ebony Rose to give you some insight from her perspective, uh, which is very different than ours. Okay, let's dive in. So one of the things we talk about at Chalkbeat a lot is that philanthropy is a team sport. Uh, and we've really deeply invested our leadership, particularly in philanthropy, which is different than some of the other places I've worked, where it's been more of, uh, it's been harder, it feels like a certain team's job to uh, work on revenue and nobody else is touching it. We talk about, excuse me, donors and prospects um, and even some of our ER in our leadership teams meetings. Uh, we have cultivation teams where we say who in the organization is best positioned to give us information about this donor. And we have strategy meetings. Um, and then we have, you know, we're lucky enough to have a fairly robust revenue team at this point. Um, and so while somebody might be the portfolio owner, they may not be the relationship manager. So what I mean by that is, although they're responsible for moving the work forward, we might have somebody else on the team, the CEO or the editor in chief, um, or somebody who just knows the donor um, or is working on some of our donors fund, like uh, early childhood, let's say. We might have a reporter who wants to share what they're working on on early childhood. Um, and so we'll have the portfolio manager set that relation, that uh, conversation, ship up, conversation up so that we can be closer, we can bring our donors really close to the work and the impact. Um, so we share that, although we manage the relationships on the revenue team, we really share the responsibility and consider it um, everybody's work to be involved in revenue. I'm curious how you see that play out uh, across your portfolio, Revenue Rose. Well, so I think this is the first time I'm hearing that uh, philanthropy is a team sport, but it makes sense. Uh, it, it makes sense uh, for a bunch of different reasons. So one, um, I think from my perspective, I do think about being kind of in relationship uh, with our grantees uh, and we are funding the whole organization. We're not funding uh, necessarily like the development department, right? Like we want to get to know your work. Uh, we want to get to know what you're wrestling with. We want to know like what you're excited about. Um, literally, when we have our check-ins, uh, a lot of times uh, a consistent, I would say, bullet point on our agenda will, will be latest and greatest. Uh, why? Uh, because a lot of times when we, especially if we have a multi-year grant, we set those terms uh, in advance and then like life happens, uh, the world happens. Uh, and so not only do I want to hear about okay, how are you making progress towards the goals we set? Um, I really want to know, like, what is it that you're most excited about? What is it that you're most proud of? Um, that might be outside of, um, again, those goals, but are definitely important to the work you're doing. So um, that makes sense to me. Uh, and I would, I would say that that also makes sense thinking back on what I've experienced on our check-in so far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I love hearing you say that because one of the pieces we things we wrote about in the roadmap was we share both the good and the bad with our funders. Uh, I think early in my career, I was really scared to share what was not going well. Uh, well, we're all running businesses and working in organizations and we are imperfectly perfect. Um, things are never going to be all right, all good. And what I've seen over my career is that mm -hmm 
funders want to hear what we're struggling with um, and also often have resources or networks to leverage and help, especially if we are building trust and really letting them in. Um, so we crack the door pretty wide open for our funders to say, this is hard. And we've all lived you know, through the last three years where the world has been wildly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And I think that to paint um, a very linear picture would have been insincere, uh, both to our work, but also to our readers who are navigating the world alongside us. And so we wanted to present a really uh, authentic and truthful picture um, to you and to our other funders. And I'm curious, how that plays out for you if you what you do when people tell you bad news or if you have trouble having donors or um, grantees tell you what's wrong. Yeah, so um, it's funny you use the word insincere. It would have been insincere. Uh, honestly, I I think of it as it would have been suspicious. Uh, I, I, my, uh, <laughs> my spidey senses start tingling uh, anytime um, it's all good news all the time uh, for, for a few different reasons. So one, um, philanthropy is an interesting seat to sit because we get a bird's eye view of a lot of stuff. And so you can think that like we don't know, but a lot of times we actually do know um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Like it's not like we have a network of spies or anything, but uh, everybody else is telling us what's going on. Um, so you probably should too. And I would say um, being proactive about it is the right way uh, for many of the reasons Amy outlined, like the idea that we have resources, we do. Uh, we do have resources and depending on the foundation, uh, you might be able to talk about uh, when you're either like when you're setting up the grant, hey, here's some things that we need to grow or we're trying to learn about um, that could actually be Part of your goals and it uh it might behoove you uh to talk about like what resources you need uh, to get there um i've seen that built into grant agreements um because we do want you to be successful like in an investment can be uh the actual dollars that come in the door uh investment can also be um connections to other partners it can be um different arrangements we set up uh, so that you can get support you need either as a leader of an organization or just to build organizational capacity. Um, but if we don't know what problems you're wrestling with, uh, we, we're, we're definitely not going to get the answer right as far as supporting you. Um, but to think that if you just don't tell us any bad news, that we don't assume that there's bad news, um, is, is might be a little naive. Uh, <laughs> So I, I would say that we we definitely appreciate like literally the good, the bad uh, and the ugly because we're invested in your success, which is I can also acknowledge counterintuitive, um, so counterintuitive. I did not always work in philanthropy. I've worked in government. Um, I worked in nonprofit. Uh, I never felt like, you know what the right thing to do is tell um, the person who's given me money all the words. <laughs> Uh, of the organization and at the same time um you, you like being honest and being authentic is important um and so a lot of times if you think about it as more of a partnership uh think about it as your partner wrestling with you i love that and i feel like you all definitely live up to that uh and one of the pieces that you know you were saying tell us everything because we set some of the grant agreements before life happens right mm -hmm. and i think one of the pieces that i was drawn to about chalkbeat was how we measure success um and i was very i was fascinated by um impact journalism i've worked in nonprofits um and helped set grant agreements for over 20 years now 20 years and the idea of measuring impact by informed action and informed debate instead of only by reach, um, but really what comes from the journalism in our communities was fascinating to me and I think has really highlighted and been a, um, a place where our foundations love to invest mm -hmm. um, and learn more about how we track our, um, our impacts. 
And I'm curious what you're seeing from an impact standpoint and how measurement informs your work and also how it changes over the lifetime of a grant. Yeah, I mean, I would say that we're fascinated too. Uh, mm -hmm. impact, uh, it's hard, right? Right, it's hard. It doesn't, and, and it's hard. Uh, so a little bit of background that might be helpful. So at Schusterman, I help support the grantees that are policy, advocacy, and comms. Uh, so they're particularly hard uh, because those grantees are dealing in um, the context of the world. Um, it's the work that is uh, changing hearts and changing minds. And uh, a lot of times is uh, long term. Uh, it doesn't happen too often that you put out, I don't know, one story or one piece of information and then magically everybody changes their mind and starts to do something different. That's kind of not how that works. Uh, we do actually know that uh, in philanthropy. And so um, we try to wrestle with and wrestle with our grantees. Like, what is it that you're measuring? Um, how um, can we learn from that? What um, what are the right horizons uh, for the work uh, is also something that I think is particularly uh, important because you could be measuring the right things in the wrong time frame uh, mm -hmm. and it still not show up uh, in the way you want it to. I do think the um, question like the reach, right, the in these days, like you have so much that's virtual, the engagement numbers, so like the clicks, those are those are easy to measure um, and we want to know those things. Uh, because we, it's, it's also something easy for us to communicate up. Um, but I think what is more helpful uh, is helping us think about, like these questions, how do we think about impact? How do we think about measurement? Um, so that we can adapt and change too. Um, because I, I, I don't know anyone who is a, a program officer uh, who is who does not appreciate about their job that they can learn. Uh, and that we have the flexibility uh, to learn and change and that we have a certain responsibility, I think, uh, not just to our uh, organization and our philanthropy and our mission and our vision, but to our grantees. Uh, we, we, you know, we tend to enjoy our grantees. Like that's my uh, favorite part of my job is uh, learning from and learning with uh, my grantees when, they, or at least when they let me. I love that. I'll be curious to hear how other folks are doing it. And so, uh, and talking about impact. So please share in the comments. Um, and I have two more uh, questions uh, and then we'll open it up for a question, uh, two more questions on, on our end and then we'll open it up to the broader group. And so one question I get a lot is how did Chalkbeat get started in uh, raising money and what does it look like today? And what I share is that we are we are very foundation heavy. Uh, foundations are a great place to start because they are generally more formal and that actually is helpful uh, as you're getting started in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, you can go on the website, you can see who to contact, um, but don't get stuck or lost there because really being in the real world, I think especially after we've been online and hybrid or some version of that for so long that the best relationships come from often come from in person from running into somebody from getting an introduction to somebody um, but doing your research and building your found your foundation prospects first can be really uh, a great place to start as you're getting your as you're building your nonprofit business or your local news business uh, what do you look for, Ebony Rose, when you're seeing uh, a new nonprofit get started, and um, especially in local news? Uh, so new is definitely um, different than established, right? So uh, I want to know, like, what your plan is uh, to, like, like what, where you think you're going to go get the money from, right? Uh, I want to know, like, who's on your board. Uh, I want to know, uh, like, who's in your leadership, right? Like, it, it's more about um, what you, what your vision is uh, than anything else, I would say, at that point. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's the most important thing. As, and, that, and that changes over time. Uh, I would say 
for, I have a couple of media grantees that we support uh, and they do actually have different models. Um, so like for an organization who is uh, national with a bureau structure like you all, uh, I want to see a mix of both mm-hmm. national funders uh, and regional funders. I want to know if you're planning on growing, um, what's your green lighting process? So like, how are you making decisions? Because uh, sometimes there are so many different opportunities um, that people say yes to all the things. Um, and it really just kind of buries them uh, in a way they're not expecting. So like, what like what are you prioritizing? How do you green light things? Uh, I would say I care about um, and then just like what uh, types of revenue uh, might you be considering in the future? So um, for some people, it's like, OK, we start with foundations, then we move to individual donors. Uh, then we you know, are trying to mix up. Um, what is it? New existing donors or we're trying to mix up balance national and regional. Um, some people start to do membership and earn revenue. Um, if, if that's a route you want to go, I want to know how you're going to get that done. Like, do you have the capacity to actually do it? And uh, or are you asking the right questions, thinking about putting the right people in place uh, to to do that work? Uh, because it is it is different. That's it's a completely different beast. Um, so it doesn't have to be that someone is leveraging all the things. I think it's more so um, does your mix make sense uh, for supporting the work you want to do? Um, and is it is it sustainable? I know that that's always like the tricky word, like what is sustainability uh, and it hurts to hear. Um, but those are those are really the questions uh, that we ask or at least I ask. I, speak for yeah. I ask a lot. <laughs> uh, those are so helpful. And it uh, takes me into our last point and then we'll go to some questions from the um, from our friends and guests. Um, or the audience. So we are diversifying now. Um, I think we started to diversify over the past five years as we started to test some of these ideas. So some of the ideas that came up with like, should we have membership? Um, Mm -hmm. Where does membership live on the team? Can membership bring in enough to um, warrant it's the capacity it takes to do it well? Um, And I've seen some newsrooms do it extremely well and lean on it very heavy. Uh, and we did, we have a membership team. Um, it's a part-time person um, and we tested it. We tested it for about three years. And I think where I stand right now is that membership is a really important grassroots effort to feed the rest of our strategies. Um, so we'll probably continue to invest in it part-time as a part-time FTE. Um, I'm like pulling back the curtain. Um, but it also is so important for readers to be able to give, to be invested in um, this access, uh, total access uh, news and information. And so we really want to give our community a chance to invest in the work that they find really invaluable. Uh, one effort that we're kicking around, my background is uh, I started in uh, individual philanthropy and but know that individuals give about between 70 and 80% of all philanthropy in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want that to be reflected in our, in our pie. Um, and I think that we're ready for that. So we're going to launch a major gifts campaign. Um, right now we have individuals who give, but they're not in a campaign or in a coordinated effort. Uh, And so we're thinking about what that looks like um, to really to your point around regional or market-based philanthropy. Um, And so people want to invest in their communities and we wanna have a way that they can do that through Chalkbeat. Mm -hmm. Um, And so starting to build, you know, regional cabinets of uh, funders across our bureaus across the country. So. That's something we're starting to think about so that I'm seeing some of the questions come in so that we can balance risk too in our portfolios. We know it's a, the economy is um, not the most stable economy we've seen. I hope that's not news to anyone. Um, And we really want our philanthropy to be balanced across foundations, across individuals, uh, across our sponsorships. We have um, an ER program as well. 
that we know is, you know, one of the reasons our earned revenue is so valuable is because it's all unrestricted. Mm-hmm. And so it's unrestricted dollars. Um, and yet we also know that advertising can be sus- susceptible to the market trends more quickly. So these are some of the things that, that we think about. Um, I'm curious what you have to add, Ebony Rose, and then we'll go to some of the comments from the audience. No, I mean, I think I think those are the right things. Um, the only thing I would just underscore is like what you said about being ready. Like, is this something we're ready to do, right? Like not trying to say, all right, what are all the avenues for revenue and trying to get them at the same time? Because that's not real. Um, and then like that trade off between like how much capacity and effort do, do we need to put into something? What is it going to cost us uh, versus what's the return? Right. Like that, that's always the hard part. The thing that um, I've seen sometimes, and I think it's really smart, uh, is when people will say, hey, we are, and you all have done this, right? Like you all have said, hey, we're looking at um, trying to build out this section of our work, like this capacity. Uh, is that something that uh, you all would consider, right? Like like helping to invest in, or um, sometimes you might want to ask, I don't, and people are foundation is set up differently as far as like gen ops versus project and all the things. Um, but maybe uh, something to consider would be to say, okay, we want to hire someone who's a major gifts officer. Um, mm-hmm. That costs this in the budget. Is that something uh, you would be willing to invest in? And of course, I don't mean specifically major gifts. I'm to insert mm-hmm. whatever uh, strategy exactly. you to explore. Um, but that also makes it clearer for the funder. Um, what your plans are, uh, what you need to grow, uh, and what you envision your future looking like. I love that. Yeah, that's so important. And just to give folks, uh, by no means do I want to say that we are, we should be replicated exactly, but to give you a single data point, uh, Chalkbeat will be celebrating 10 years uh, in the next year, and we're just we're starting to think about our major gifts campaign i've worked at other places where we started with a major gifts campaign uh and really supplemented it with our foundation work Mm -hmm. i think one of my takeaways in the last year as i'm learning um nonprofit news is that this is an emerging market and the foundations seem to be on it first they are developing and testing funding um in this world and so it's a great place to start uh and our individuals are learning more about it and, and are getting ready to invest. Um, some are investing significantly already. So that's how we evolved. Um, I'm sure there are many other models. Let's, I see some great questions coming in. All right, Ebony Rose, I'm gonna toss the first one to you. Uh, what's the number one mistake you see organizations make when they approach your foundation? Great um, question. Number one mistake. I mean, I think, I think before approaching anyone, it's kind of like, how do I put this? So I have uh, three younger sisters. Um, I have one sister who um, is the person who literally will look up uh, the new person she's dating or, and we'll do the same thing for her friends. Like she'll run all the, she'll run all the stuff. She wants to know who she's dealing with. Right. Um, that might be a little bit much, uh, for a date. Uh, but, uh, in dating foundations, you absolutely want to do that. Like you want to know, uh, what they care about. And I think sometimes people lead with, um, they, they, they skip that step. Like you, you have to know, like, what it is essentially that they fund, what the ethos is, what the values are. Um, Because the program officer might want to help you out, but essentially at the end of the day, um, I have to spend money on the things that the person whose money it is for real cares about. It's not my money. Mm -hmm. Um, And I never lose sight of the fact that it's not my money. And so I think the biggest mistake people make uh, is not... um, taking the time to figure out if there is uh, a strategic fit um, when that information is available. That doesn't mean you uh, are gonna get it right all the time, but um, there is a certain amount of, I think, openness you have to have uh, to 
just moving on if someone tells you no. I, I think that, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, to, you just do the homework, make sure the fit is there. Uh, if the fit is not there, uh, you also might like you might try figure out the fit is not there uh, and no one kind of like to move on because a lot of times people try to let you down softly without saying no. Um, and it's worth maybe going back a year from now or whatever it is. But um, sometimes you're wasting time and energy uh, and the person is really trying to say, I cannot help you out uh, when you can move on to someone else. It's um, like I'm, I'm an elected official when I ran for office. I knew I didn't need all the votes. I just needed the most. So uh, it's true. And like, I'm not going to spend 30 minutes arguing with someone who I know is not going to vote for me. I'm going to move. I'm going to take five minutes to talk to this person who really just wants to, uh, you know, see my face, know what I care about, and I'll get that vote. And I could get six votes instead of wasting my time with this one vote. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's not that you don't try, but... Uh, do the homework, figure out where you fit or not. Um, and if someone's kind of hinting that you don't fit, maybe don't put as much effort into that. Uh, maybe put yeah. more effort into the, the warmer uh, relationship, if that's helpful. So helpful. And uh, I think build on the next question, uh, which is, it's for me. It's so weird to read my own question. Um, how do you, ha so Amy, how do you handle the fact that grants sometimes don't renew or fall apart uh, through no fault of your own? Can you plan around that? Uh, and so one, I think um, there's a book, I usually have it on my desk. Um, I think it's actually by my bed right now called um, Crucial Conversations. And I actually think that having really crucial conversations with your donors, uh, with everyone in your life is really important uh, and helpful. And so for so there's two parts to this. One, I don't like surprises. Sometimes they happen. Sometimes somebody isn't going to renew and that's a surprise. But if I could know earlier, I try to come in with a lot of curiosity. Or you think, do you have plans to renew us? I think we often, uh, money is a sticky subject. Mm -hmm. And we all bring our own baggage to it, honestly. And so I think it's a conversation that can often, we often avoid it, but I would say go for it. Have the conversation with your program officers. What are your plans for this grant? How does this fit into your portfolio? Uh, are we meeting your expectations? I wanna know all of those things. And if the answer is no, I was just talking to um, our leadership team about this. I would rather know now. I would rather have be uncomfortable now and have to have the time to figure it out, either to fix it or to find another donor, um, than to push it off and not want to hear the answer and then be uncomfortable later. So I try to really know where my donors are as much as they'll tell me. Um, and then also, so that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is um, having a robust pipeline. And so really we're working prospects all the time uh, because I know that not everybody's gonna renew. That's not a world I've ever lived in. Um, I have really high renewal rates and some people are gonna either change organizations, they don't have the same funds to give. Mm -hmm. um, they think the climate is really important right now. So they're gonna take their funding from one area and put it into another. And yeah. I think one, there's plenty of money to go around. I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna about fundraising. And two, I also know that it's okay. Like they're also really important. Um, the climate is really important. Local news is really critical. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like I'm in competition uh, with different funding areas. I was just telling somebody I just adopted a dog. Like um i the humane society is also important so there's a lot of different places of people's heart um and minds that they want to have impact and i respect that um and our world needs a lot of help so i hope we're all involved in it yeah. um so i want to have a robust pipeline we are we just hired like what's the concrete step we just hired a researcher um i think a researcher is wildly valuable to any fundraising team um, there's also a lot of contract researchers if you can't have one full time and they really give it to Ebony Rose's point, like they help you do your homework. 
Um, and our researcher is incredible. She lives in Denver and she clocks her time. So she says, this took me about 10 to 15 minutes to figure out. It's all public information. Mm -hmm. And it really helps me understand how to approach uh, the strategy for a prospect or a donor. Um, I see you adding, do you have, I see you nodding. Do you have anything to add, Ebony Rose? Yeah, I mean, that, so like I said, I did not work, it's not like I was just like born working in uh, philanthropy. Um, I can think of two times in my career where I had to move on because grants ended, right? And, and one of them, I had a good chunk of staff uh, who was funded uh, by that grant and that was hard. At the same time, um, our development team had worked really hard uh, to try to diversify, you know, that funding stream. But I don't think I don't like in retrospect, we were able to tell people months in advance this was a possibility. Um, and we still should have while we communicated that early, it still sucked. It still hurt. Um, I mean, I've like fired people for real for like cause. It really sucks to be able to say, uh, to have to say to someone, you know, I really wish we could keep doing this work, but I don't have the money um, to do it, right? And and we, and we all have to move on, right? And like shut the thing down. And at the same time, um, we should have started earlier as far as the, the fundraising team, the people responsible um, to make sure that diversification was in place. So like I would say the diversification is probably the most important thing you can do um, to be like when you think about like positions or um, parts of your work or however you're structured, uh, making sure there are funding streams that cut across is really important. <clears throat> so that's one. Two, um, realistic projections are really important. Um, I a, a easy way to think about this, I was talking about um, uh, budgets with my mom. Um, I, we were, were planning a, a thing and she was like, well, tell me all the things you want because it's it's um, it's an engagement party. Tell me all the things that you want. And I was like, well, first we need to have a conversation about the budget and what we can afford. And where, like, where's the money going to come from? Like, is it my budget? I'm paying for this as one donor and you are going to also give a little bit because then the budget is different or is it you plus me plus him plus his parents? You know what I'm talking Like, what, what are we talking about? What's the budget? Because if not, honestly, it's just a wish list uh, that can add up to anything. And then if you just keep, if I just keep adding stuff, because I can always find something nice. Uh, to buy or to give to the people who come to my party or all the things, then the numbers go higher and higher and higher. And so like having a realistic set of projections and a realistic pipeline is super important. Um, because if not, then you will put yourself in a position where you are always coming up short or 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 getting lucky. And sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, mm -hmm. And saying like, all right, here's all the stuff we have going on. Either we can pay for it or we can't. But like, you know, good projections, mm -hmm. conservative projections um, are really yeah. important. Totally. Making hard choices up front so you don't have to make hard choices in the back end. Um, somebody said, could you share what you're using for impact modeling? We set up, um, we call it the MORI, and it was actually a series for this um it was a session for this series, and I think Anne Marie will link to it in an email tomorrow. So we're really measuring informed impact, informed debate, and informed action. Um, it is imperfect, but it's also really interesting. Uh, clearly, we don't know everywhere that uh, our news is influencing our, the work um, and the community, but we do our best to capture what we can and uh, share it back. Both of our team, it's really why people come to work at Chalkbeat uh, and with our funders. Um, so that's one piece. And again, we'll send out more details on that uh, in tomorrow's email. And then let me get to an, the next question. Um, somebody says, I publish three online community news publications north of Seattle, um, and I'm planning to convert to a nonprofit 501c3. 
um, with an application filed with the IRS. We are currently funded through a combination of advertising revenue and individual donations. That's great. Um, what advice do you have as first steps to take in developing a broader donor base? We plan to continue with our paid sponsorships. Seems a bit more tricky for small news organizations. Ebony Rose, do you have a recommendation or I'm happy to share my thoughts? Well, I mean, getting a 501c3 is good. Uh, I feel like most people are set up to give to 501c3s, right? So that, that opens you up. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know uh, your area, right? But like, it might actually be helpful if you talk to some of the donors you have uh, to see if they'll help you as far as um, the broader landscape, making introductions uh, and tapping into their networks. Um, one of the things that um, I realized I neglected to say, not neglected to say, maybe just didn't come up until now, right? Um, sometimes somebody can't give you money, uh, but you can say, like, they'll make an introduction for you. Um, or they might be able to host something for you where they bring other uh, funders, donors, uh, people who have money uh, to the table. Uh, that's always a good way to expand uh, your network and have a warm uh, introduction uh, to people mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, you know, a cold email is sometimes it works, uh, but if, if they can't open up their uh, Rolodexes, are those still a thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yes, yes, I totally agree. Uh, and the other piece I would say is leverage your readership. So it sounds like you have strong readership. Tell them that you're moving to a nonprofit um, and you know, ask if they ask them for introductions as well. And then I would also share with um, any local foundations your plans. Um, I find that the, the phrase works pretty well. Um, ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, get money. Um, I think that folks who have seen this happen before are, this community is so generous. Um, and we're all learning. And so be really curious. And I would say go to some local foundations or the local community foundation, mm -hmm. and see if they're funding someone similar to you, um, and could put you in touch or in a, in a grant. Um, like giving circle or a community space uh, who, with others who are doing similar work. Um, can you share, I presume it's me, can you share what my current revenue streams are and how we're indexing for display ads um, in my revenue, in the revenue model for Chalkbeat? Um, we seem poised to, poised to see less ad buys and are spending in the next year. Has that changed any of our plans? So we have a, um, our earned revenue is about 8%, 8 to 9% um, of our overall budget. And um, to be transparent, our foundations are 80% and our major gifts are 10%. Um, I'm hoping over the next five years that we'll get um, foundations and major gifts equal at about 40% and we'll double our earned revenue. Um, we are seeing a very small slowing in earned revenue and ad buys this year. Um, also, we had some transition on our ad team, so it's interesting to hear you ask this question because I, I thought it was due to our capacity, but maybe it's um, reflective of some of the trends we're seeing in the market. Um, so it has not shifted because it's a relatively small percentage um, of our overall pie, uh, but we're definitely excuse me, paying attention um, to it and seeing if it affects, if it's gonna drop below 8%. So that's how we think about it. What, what's our threshold and where are we? Our fundraising goal is always above our operations, um, our operational budget. Um, and hopefully it'll be further above as we continue to grow and become more sophisticated. But we want to have one, we want to have hopefully opportunity for um, editorial to spend. Our goal in revenue is to raise as much money so that we can meet the highest level of potential for our editorial team. Um, and at the same time, it gives us a buffer so that if 
earned revenue takes a hit because of the economy or capacity that we can make up some on philanthropy. So we're uh, constantly balancing the scales um, so that we can cover our expenses. I see someone says, Student Reporting Labs finally started major gifts at 13 years. Uh, congratulations. Um, and can you talk about moving existing funders from targeted to general funding? Ebony Rose, I'm curious how you see people have this conversation with, with you on um, restricted versus unrestricted grants. Well, so uh, I can't say that my advice here would be terribly uh, helpful because uh, it's honestly uh, because we are our ethos is very much uh, gen ops. I I get, so don't I mean so I'm pretty sure people will come looking for me after this. I, I will also be pretty mm -hmm. transparent and saying like, uh, yeah. I mean we're we're <laughs> our ethos is gen ops uh, and that's true across uh, all of our areas of giving. Um, don't everybody come looking for me because <laughs> our budget is accounted for <laughs> right now. But um, yeah, that's not, that's yeah. not, uh, we, we um, very rarely are having a conversation where it's like, okay, we have to move from project uh, to, because we just don't, that's just not how our, yeah. um, how we're set up. Some I guess if someone, I guess if I need it to, I don't know how how to say this, but like essentially, like you, the, maybe it's helpful for me to talk about why we're a gen ops funder uh, because we t we try to find organizations that uh, just align more broadly with what uh, Schusterman cares about in the world, uh, and we definitely understand um, that it costs money to like keep the lights on, and we want the organization as a whole to be successful. Um, be, that being said, when we do a gen ops grant, um, I care a lot about the organizational health. Um, I think if you are, if it's something that's more transactional, more project based, like there are times where like I'll, I'll have a contract or, um, there might be something like a discreet, super discreet project, um. I'm probably not caring so much about uh, your organizational health, your financial health, uh, all the all the questions I would ask uh, around how the inner workings work. Uh, I think once you get gen ops funding, you need to be really clear with people around like what it costs uh, to run the organization. Uh, they still want to know where their money is going to, right? So like. Um, Everything from like what your, we start asking questions about like what your structure is, what your board is, what your uh, strategic plan is, all the how are you planning on like what are your plans for growth? Or sometimes it's going to be a conversation around uh, pruning to health. Like we we have all those kind of conversations. So uh, I would say if it is changing from project based to gen ops, uh, be prepared for a shift uh, in a lot more questions, a lot more conversation around organizational health than just like why are we funding this thing to get this done um so so maybe That's i do great. some advice but um, <laughs> but yeah it is a it's a it, it's not a conversation that i have often um mm -hmm. because most of most of our grantees are gen ops and we have some dis some projects rolled in that that we care about right like things that there are things that i care about but, um, That's great advice I would add uh, for major gifts, I think campaigns can be really powerful. Um, for So something that it feels like you're wrapping your impact in a bow and people are giving to your impact even though it's um, general operating. Uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. I think campaigns can, they take on a life of their own. But they're actually pretty, uh, they're, they're a pretty simple tool. Uh, so I think about, you know, like a, Freedom of the Press Fund or a, um, something where it's more, you're naming your impact, you're naming your organization in a different way so people feel like they're giving to impact, um, but it's really a gen ops um, ask 
and you're clear about that, um, but that it does feel packaged. So uh, we are at time. And so we'll take one more question and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, I think our you have our contact information or Anne-Marie, you, you're welcome to provide mine in the um, follow-up email tomorrow. I know there is a, there's a question about conferences for potential grantees. I feel like there's other people better positioned to answer that than I am. So you guys should share it uh, so I can learn from you. Um, and then I have, there's the last question we're going to take is, do you have any advice for an emerging nonprofit under five years with a development team of one person? Um, and so one, I'll say congratulations. Um, and I have two pieces of advice. Uh, my first piece of advice is take care of yourself. Um, we, that sounds like a rest, it could be a recipe for burnout. Um, so prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. And it's that idea of put on your oxygen mask first. Like, what do you need to stay uh, dedicated to this work and invested in this work? Um, because losing you over the long term is actually worse for the organization um, than you working a little less um, or having ruthless prioritization. Um, and at that point, I would also say, like, where do you get the most bang for your your buck or your time your time is really your most valuable commodity at this point um so going to you know membership might not be the best uh, avenue because it's a lot of work for small gifts yes um so are there a few places that you can get larger gifts um and maximize your effort mm -hmm. ebony rose yeah i would say two things one um i don't know if it's a ceo a president executive director Whoever that person is, uh, that like the buck stops here person, their responsibility is definitely development, which you probably already know. Um, yeah, so they uh, are gonna have to take on some of that weight, a lot of that weight. And a lot of times they're the person uh, who can close the deal anyway, right? Um, two, that person should also be uh, leaning on a board uh, who can help them get dollars in the door, uh, whether that is through people in their network and individual gifts or uh, connections to foundations, corporations, whatever, um, but the board. Uh, and, if, and if there aren't people on the board who can do that, um, maybe that's a conversation that needs to be had, <laughs> right? About, oh, maybe we need to add someone uh, or one or two people to our board with that explicit purpose um, so we can grow and we can you know we can, we can keep the lights on uh, that's the thing uh, so that would be your development team your your uh your other c-suite people your c-suite people uh and the board oh i double click on that i think that's such good advice ebony rose thank you so much for being here and for joining us you're i think it's really rare that we get to have such an intimate conversation um like this thank you all for joining us uh, and with that, I think you'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow um, and we will sign off. Thanks for your time, everyone. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you, Amy.